Good morning, everyone. It's Pastor Jim Harkabus from the Canyon Community Church in beautiful Lakehead, California. It's February the 6th, 2022. This morning, we'll be looking at the Gospel of Luke, and we're looking at the study of prayer, and specifically the Lord's Prayer, or perhaps better put, the disciples' prayers. The Lord taught his disciples how to pray. God, you're with us. Let us join our service in progress. Being the first Sunday of the month, we're going to be continue our custom of breaking away from our regular series of messages, which is currently in Revelation, to consider another portion of God's Word. So we'll be in the Gospel of Luke this morning. So you want to open your Bibles with me to the 11th chapter of the Gospel according to Luke. As we do, we're going to find in our opening verses, touching on the subject of prayer. And really in such a way that none of the other Gospels cover it. There is a similar passage in Matthew's Gospel concerning the prayers that we're going to look at this morning, but it's not presented, Luke presents it in a different way. I'm reading this morning Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. They're all going to read Matthew 6, 5 to 14, look at the two passages together, then we'll, but we'll be focused on Luke this morning. I'm reading Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And he said to him, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And then he said to him, Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine is coming friend from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers and says, Do not bother me, the door is already shut and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get, get up to get you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, that because of his persistence he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Verse 9, So I tell you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And who seeks, finds. To him who knocks, it will be opened. Now, suppo now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not then give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if you've asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? And if you then, being evil, knowing how to give good gifts to your children, how much more would your holy, Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? I'm also going to read Matthew chapter 6 this morning, a parallel passage, slightly different, but the same context as we're talking about the Lord's Prayer, actually it's better dubbed the Disciples' Prayer, and we'll talk about that more in just a minute. But I'm reading from Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 14. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount was talking about prayer. And in verse 5 he says, When you pray, you're not to be like hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room and close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetitions as the Gentiles do, for they suppose to be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need even before you ask. Pray then in this way. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you would not forgive others, then your Heavenly Father will not forgive your transgressions. And he goes on to talk about other things, to talk about fasting in the passage. We're looking back this morning to Luke chapter 11. As I mentioned, Luke presents the, the Lord's Prayer, or the Disciples' Prayer, in a slightly different fashion than Matthew does, and he gives some application to that. And as an outline about prayer, he'll be talking about the, the um, pattern for prayer. We'll be looking at the persistence in prayer. Then we're talking about the promises 
for prayer. I want to talk just briefly about prayer. The importance of prayer cannot be overemphasized. In fact, we need to be students of prayer. And it helps you, if you, you read the scripture, you come across any prayer in the Bible, just to examine it very closely, what the prayer is about. And also, when you pray with others, be a student of how others pray, especially if you're a newer Christian. I learned so much about praying by being around other Christians and praying older Christians in the Lord and learned so many good points of prayer. But we're going to cover some points of prayer. How does one pray and what is prayer? There's a great need in the church today, not of more methods or programs, but a need for prayer. It was Ian Bounds. He wrote, he says, what the church needs today is not more or better machinery, not new organizations or more novel methods of doing things, but men and women who the Holy Spirit can use. Men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. The Holy Spirit does not flow through methods, but through people. He does not come upon machinery, but comes upon men. He does not anoint plans, but people, men, people of prayer. And J. Hudson Taylor, if you're familiar with him, he was the founder of the China Inland Mission in 1865, I think it is. And later, the China Inland Mission later changed his name to Overseas Missionary Fellowship International. It was a mission, it started out as a mission field to China. But with the communist takeover in 1949 and 1950-51, they had to pull the missionaries out of China. And so they helped the other Asian countries in bringing the gospel to them. But Hudson Taylor said this, said that the prayer power has never been tried to its fullest capacity. If we want to see mighty works of divine power and, and grace wrought in the place of weakness, failure, and disappointment, let us answer God's standing challenge. He said, call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. And if you want to do a biography of Hudson Taylor, it's an amazing story of this man by faith was led from England to go to China as a missionary. And he took his family and, and, and a handful of other, of other couples. And on the way, he led 20 people to, to Christ on the ship that we're going to. And he had a great, empowering work, but attributed it all to the power of prayer. And it's one of the things we're often we're missing in our life today, in our individual life, and even as a corporate body of believers, we're missing that aspect of prayer. Going back to Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And it came about that while he was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. The Bible records that Jesus prayed often, and often would go by himself away from the group to pray. And apparently one of the disciples overheard him praying one day, and so was asked him. And you know, it's the interesting thing. If Jesus, the perfect man, the Son of God, prayed a lot on this while well, he walked on this earth, how much more do we need to spend time in prayer? Again, I talk about, we'll cover three aspects of prayer this morning. The pattern for prayer, persistence in prayer, and promises for prayer, but a pattern of prayer. Many people, when they pray, they recite prescribed prayers. I remember as raised in the Lutheran background, and I, I memorized, had to memorize the Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer, and I we say it at table, would say it at grace, and this and that, and people still recite, recite prayers. But that's not prayer. That's just something reciting something. Prayer by definition is simply talking to God. And Jesus is going to introduce something. It's not what he said. It's the pattern of, of reciting prayer that's important. But the principles of prayer that he's teaching is the important part. And he begins by saying, and he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, or our Father, who are in heaven in Matthew's account. And it's interesting to know that Jesus introduces a new concept with God. He's not some distant deity. He's the Father. And I know, I was thinking about this this morning, as a culture, we struggle with that because of dysfunctional families. Many people don't know what it means to have a father. Many people come from broken rela relationships. They may, not know their, they may know their father's name. They may not know who their father was. But they have no concept of a father. And I want to encourage you as men, especially with men with children in a home, look to what Jesus is teaching and revealing about our Heavenly Father. 
Because what, what the important, one of the most heaviest responsibility on a, on a dad or a father is this. How people, our children, how they relate to us as a dad is how they're going to relate to their Heavenly Father. That's a heavy, heavy responsibility. And many people are struggling because they don't have a, a good, healthy father concept person in their life. Thus, they struggle with understanding a God who loves them unconditionally because they never had that. And that's you. Maybe that's you. But understand, you have a heavenly Father who loves you with an everlasting love. And as we look at this passage, you're going to see, you find out you have a Father, a heavenly Father, who loves you so much. And it's revealed in this passage. He says, you pray, say our Father. And of course, that introduces a point here. Is God your Father? Have you been born again? You see, Christianity is not a list of things or not religious systems of do's and don'ts. You do this, you go that, you go to this service, you do that, get baptized, all this other stuff. It is, at its core, a personal relationship with the living God. That's what Christianity is. That's what makes Christianity totally different from all other religions. Other religions, you do this, this, this in order to please God. My friends, you can't please God more than He's already pleased you. If you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can't please Him anymore. He's thrilled. And Christianity is a personal relationship with the living God as your heavenly Father. But is He your Father? You see, John 1, 12, 13 says, But to all who received Him, meaning Jesus Christ, though even to those who believe in His name, He gave them the right to become the children of God who were born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, or of a husband's will, but born of God. The new birth, when a person asks Jesus Christ in his or her life to be their Savior, a number of things take place. First off, all their sins are forgiven, but they're born again on the inside. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, all things have passed away, all things are becoming new. The new birth. But is God your Father? Have been born again. Our Father... Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The word hallowed is the word hagios. We get the, it means to make holy, to set apart. It's the opposite of common. It involves being lifted up, to be held in esteem and revered as something special. So a better translation might say, Heavenly, Our Father in heaven, let your name be made holy. Do you spend time each day reflecting on how wonderful and great God is? We just think of how good He is. God is good. He desires our best. He loves us. He wants us to prosper and have a fulfilling life. He made us, formed us from mother's womb, and He wants our very best. But do you spend time reflecting how good and great God is? Do you spend time worshiping and praising Him every day, or you just do it for a half hour or a little bit on Sunday mornings? Have you thanked Him for this day? Have you thanked Him for your health? It could be a lot worse. It can always be worse, right? Have you thanked Him for saving you? Have you thanked Him for your family, for your friends, for your church friends? There's so much to thank Him. But oftentimes we go through, we, we, we de demote prayer to you know, a, list of, a list of wants and needs. And we never take time to thank Him. So as we pray, we should acknowledge our Father who loves us in heaven. And hallowed be your name, holy be your name. The next phrase Jesus uses is, Thy kingdom come. And Matthew's account, thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. And it tells us in Matthew 6.10. See, true prayer involves seeking and requesting God's will to be accomplished. And someone has said, the purpose of prayer is not to get man's will done on earth, but to get God's will done on earth. It's not about a guest getting what we want. It's about seeking and desiring for God's will to be, be, be done in our life and in the world. Rick Warren, in his book, The Purpose to Live in Driven Life, he writes in the first sentence, it says, it's not about you. It's not about you. Yet we, world caters to that. It's about us, right? It's about our happiness and we want this, we need this, so we translate it to what we want for God, ask for God, from God. It's not about you. And it's not about me. It's about Him. And prayer is asking God to use this to accomplish what He wants. 
so that he may be glorified, his kingdom extended, and his will be done, his will be accomplished. So when we evaluate our, our, our request to God, is, we're talking about it's okay to ask him for things, but what are we asking? We'll talk a little more about that when we get into a little more of the details. When we pray, your will be done. It means you have a desire for God's will to be done in your life and in the world around you. Thy kingdom come. We, I can't spend too much time on that. We know that. We covered that in Revelation. That coming kingdom is the kingdom of righteousness. A coming kingdom of peace, joy, and prosperity. And, and only those who trust in Jesus Christ as Savior will be entering that. We saw that in Revelation chapter 20. I'm not going to develop that too much because we've already covered that. But are you praying for His kingdom to come? Did you pray for that this morning? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will is being done in heaven, by the way, it will be done on earth also. The next phrase we see is, give us this day our daily bread. You know, only once we're certain of a relationship with Him, by knowing Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we submitted ourselves to Him seeking His will in our lives, can we really bring our needs before Him. And note, needs, not greeds. It's embarrassing sometimes the things we ask. And we'll talk about God's answer to prayer just a little bit. But what are our needs? Not what we want, but what are our needs? Needs do include not only material provisions, but also greater needs when we pray for people. And I'm trying to teach that when people have a physical need, it's not just a physical need. There's also an emotional need and a spiritual need, which really transcends the, spirit, the, the physical need. Those spiritual needs are eternal. But folks, we know, and the Bible tells us, these bodies are going to wear out. But what about a person's spiritual need? The need for Jesus. To, to know Him in His glory. We learn about it in our men's Bible study. I'm praying big. of just praying that we might know the fullness of God. And we might know how much He loves us. And how we've been so blessed. So when we pray. And we pray for each other. And we pray for your physical needs. Also remember to pray for those emotional and spiritual needs. Which really are greater than the physical needs. Luke eleven four and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive other, uh, everyone who's indebted to us. I don't know about you, but each of us needs daily forgiveness. Our sins are covered by the cross, but it's still, you're a part of a family. But you know what? Sometimes family get on each other's nerves, don't they? Now your family's perfect. You don't have any family issues. Husband and wives get along just perfectly fine. You don't annoy each other, and and the children get along with the parents just perfect, and vice versa. You never have a, a crossword. No one's having a bad day, and and sometimes having. No, it, never any attitudes, right? Well, we know that's not real. But the key is to forgive. Love forgives. Just as God has forgiven us. And how much has God forgiven you? Well, we don't want to go there, right? That's a lot of forgiveness went on. We need to forgive others too. Not only for our own well-being, but because He commands us to. And because He's forgiven us. Ephesians 4, 32 says, Be kind and compassionate one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ, in Christ, God forgave you. And Luke's going to touch more on this subject later on in, in Luke's Gospel on a matter of the need to forgive others. And finally, lead us not into temptation. This prayer is asking God to guide us that we won't get out of His will and get involved in a situation of temptation. You know, it's so easy to get distracted. Life has a lot of distractions, whether it's toys or issues or a washer going out or a car problem or health problem. And the list goes on and on and on and on and on. That's before you turn the TV on, right? It's easy to get distracted, easy to get off track and lose track of Him and lose track of seeking to do His will. Persistence in prayer, verses 5 to 8, Luke covers that. It's very fascinating. He gives the story of a man knocking on his neighbor's door at night and asking for, for so, some uh, physical assistance. He has a family member come out of town or a friend come out of town and he didn't have anything. So he's asked the neighbor for, hey, can you spare me three loaves of bread? I'm reading Luke 11, verse 5. He said to him, suppose when he has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come from a, from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside, he answers, says, Do not bother me, the door is already shut, and my children are in bed, and I cannot get to give you anything. 
Jesus said, but I tell you, even though he would not get up and give him anything because he's a friend, because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Persistence in prayer. And his parables, Jesus is not saying that it, God's like a grouchy neighbor. That's what he's not saying at all. In fact, God's just the opposite. And if a, a tired, selfish neighbor meets the needs of a bothersome friend, how much more will a loving father seek to meet the, meet the needs of his own dear children? This man had to keep pounding on his neighbor's door to get a response from his reluctant, labor, reluctant neighbor. But Heavenly Father is quick to hear and willing in his perfect timing to provide for our needs. Which brings us to the promise for prayer. Verses 9 to 13 of Luke chapter 11. It says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now suppose one of you have Fathers is asked by his son for a fish, would I give him a snake instead of a fish, would he? Or if he asked for an egg, would I give him a scorpion, will he? And if you then being even know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So let's talk about the promises of prayer. Note that it says, ask, seek, and knocking. And the, the tense of these verbs are important because they're, they're present and they're ongoing. So keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. In other words, don't just do that during emergencies, but all day long. That's what Jesus did. He prayed. He prayed frequently, privately, and he prayed for the needs. James 4, let's look to James 4, 1 to 4 for a moment. And James also, in chapter 4, talks about prayer and talks about why sometimes it seems like God doesn't answer our prayers. James chapter 4, 1 to 4 says, What then is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? And by the way, he's talking to Christians. Is this not the source of your pleasures that wage war with your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and do not obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. And you ask who do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, they may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy with God. And then the passage goes on. Sometimes we don't have, because we never bother asking. You ever been gone down that road? Also, nothing's working out. This is really bad. I guess I'm going to have to pray. It's finally come to that, I have to pray, and we pray last rather than first when we're having a challenge. It isn't so much better to pray ahead of time. Again, we have a Father in Heaven who loves us, who wants to answer and meet our needs. Sometimes we don't have our needs answered because we never bother asking them. Sometimes we, the answer is going to be no. And there's a lesson for us as fathers. We live in a culture I want to be careful how I say this, but we live in a culture there where, you know, it seems like parents are supposed to give their kids everything they want. And what we have is, I see a lot of, in the world today, a lot of grown-up kids in their 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s who never learned to stand on their own. Because mommy and daddy enabled them to give them everything they want. Not what they need, but what they wanted. And we see the results of that in our society today. Our Father will give us everything we need. And He will even give us some wants. But it's always according to our, what's best for us and according to His will, not our will. Our Father gives us our needs. And to understand our needs, let's look to Matthew chapter 6 for a moment. 31. He says, don't worry then. Don't be anxious. 
saying what we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, what we're going to wear for clothing. He says, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your Heavenly Father knows you need all these things. See, God knows we have needs in these earthly bodies. We need, we need food, we need water, we need something to wear, we need shelter. He knows what we need. And God will always meet those needs. Because He's the loving Father. He's not going to give you something that you don't need. He's not going to withhold from you. He'll give you what you need. And so often more as we think about it, he's given us far more than we ever need. He could give us a tent. Many of us have a house. He could give us, he's given us a nice car. He's given us more than we need. But know what he says. He says, the eagerly, Gentiles eagerly seek all things. And see, the world seeking these things, these things, this and this and this and this and this. And, and God knows we need it. And Jesus said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And there's the promise. As we'll just seek him and his kingdom and his righteousness and all the needs we have will be met. We're so blessed. Are we not blessed? He's given us all we need and more besides. But it's important to understand he will provide those needs according to his will. And sometimes he'll say yes. Say, Lord, I really would like to do this. I think I need this. First off, are we, why are we asking for it? Is it because our basic need? Or is that something that's going to glorify and honor him? Are we seeking his will in the matter? And I'll give you an illustration in just a minute. The answer may be no. If not, maybe because it's not best for us. Or maybe the answer is still coming, and the answer is just waited just a little longer. Let me share a story from my own personal life. Several years ago, I had prayed, I had did, uh, heard the opportunity to become working for the boating safety unit of the Shasta County Sheriff's Department. It was a part-time summer job, and I was praying, oh, Lord, what would you have me to do? And it sounded interesting. I said, it seemed like it would be kind of a cool thing to do, and, and opportunities to, to be a witness to some of the deputy sheriffs and then to the community. So I prayed about it and God opened a door and I was surprised, to be quite honest, I got the job. It was fun. And I look back on it and I look back, I see I really had the, God used me for his glory to share Jesus with a number of people, had a chance to really minister to some of the church camps, a lot of church camps, and really had helped those church camps to take care of those kids. And I reminded many a camp council when I stopped them because they didn't have life jackets on, on the boat and said, what are you doing? These parents entrusted you and your church ministry with the most important thing you have and you, these kids don't have life jackets on? <laughs> it's more than a ticket. You're risking the whole ministry and you're dealing with people's precious possessions. So I really had a chance to minister to people. Well, a couple of years later, um, God closed the door. And I, I had a choice, and it seemed like the door was, God was closing the door. And so I, I loved it. It was fun, but it was time to move on. But the issue was not what I wanted. It was what he wanted. I'm thankful for that opportunity. And God has opened another door through Center Shot Archery. Because if I was doing it at Work Lake, I wouldn't have a chance to focus in on Center Shot. So God knows what he's doing in his perfect time. There's a season for everything under the sun. But the important thing is... When we pray, we talk to our Father, Father, how can I glorify you today? Not about me, but about you, about your will be done. How can I meet, touch my world, my, my, my friends, my family for Jesus Christ? How can I make a difference? And we approach and seek if his will be done in heaven and on earth, as well as on earth. And then when we ask for those needs, we'll see him open the door. He may close the door. He may say, no, I have something else in mind for you. But know this, God always has your best in mind. Because he's the Heavenly Father. He's not being mean. If he says no, it's because it's not good. it could cause damage down the road. It could hurt us or hurt others. Or he has something better. And some of you have been praying for a long time, especially for a loved one to be saved. Don't give up. Be persistent in prayer like the man knocking for the bread. 
God is working on a bigger scale than what we and I can imagine. And oftentimes, I could, I've shared stories before, of people pray for 20, 30, 40 years, and all of a sudden they see their loved one make a total change in life and become fully committed in living for Jesus Christ. And my friends, nothing's impossible with God. The power of prayer. And again, prayer is more just a rote thing we do. It is something that's a powerful, it's what we as Christians do, it's the most powerful weapon we have is prayer. Don't underestimate.
Let's stand, we'll have a song, and then we'll celebrate communion.